But now you came here to hear our legislative leadership on their insights as we head into session just a few short weeks from now. So I'd love to welcome our panel members to please kind of come up and I will introduce you once you're seated. So let's join them with a round of applause so it's not awkward coming up here by themselves. Fun when, fun when everybody's watching you on the runway, isn't it? The sign seating, yep. All right, Senator Treat, you might want to continue standing because I'm going to introduce you first. Oh. Senator Greg Treat was elected in 2011 as the state senator for, from District 47. In 2016, Treat was elected by his co colleagues in the Senate Republican Caucus to serve as Senate Majority Floor Leader. Let's give a round of applause to Senator Treat. <laughs> speaker, Charles McCall currently serves as the Speaker of the Oklahoma House of Representatives. He was elected as Speaker on January 3, 2017, and is the first Republican Speaker from Southeastern Oklahoma. He represents House District 22 and was first elected in 2012. Please welcome Speaker McCall. You ready? Okay. I'm ready. Senate Democratic Leader John Sparks was elected to represent Cleveland in the Oklahoma Senate in November 2006 and was reelected in 2010. He was appointed in 2011 to serve on the Senate Redistricting Committee as well as the Select Committee on Pensions. Please welcome Senator Sparks. <laughs> House Minority Leader Steve Copeland was first elected to the Oklahoma House of Representatives in November of 2008. Prior to being elected as House Minority Leader, he served as the Minority Caucus Chair. In May 2017, Representative Copeland was elected House Democratic Minority Leader. Let's welcome. And last but not least, our moderator for today is Brad Krieger. Brad is Executive Vice President and Regional Manager for Arvest Bank and Vice Chair of mm -hmm. Government Relations for the Greater Oklahoma City Chambers Executive Committee. Let's give our panel a hand. Thanks, Rhonda. Uh, let's go ahead and begin. The panel members will each uh, respond to questions, and they'll have two minutes or less to respond, except in the first question. It's an exception. Um, the panelists, and for each subsequent question, I mean, we'll start with Senator Treat on the first question, and the subsequent questions will just go down the panel. Uh, Speaker McCall will be the second get the second question, start that out, and that way we'll just kind of rotate that through. The timer is in front, and uh, <laughs> so it's kind of a countdown for every two minutes, except the first question, which is gonna be four. Um, so please, please try to keep your, your answer within the allotted time. First question, and Senator Crete, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Senator, or Speaker McCall, um, Senator Sparks, and then Representative Copeland. You've already heard about uh, both, you know, directly and subliminally about Step Up Oklahoma to generate new revenue and various reforms that, that people think needs attention. I want to break the question into two parts, allowing each part two minutes in, in order to respond. The first part is, do you believe it's a reasonable compromise to address the need for greater financial stability to give teachers a $5,000 raise? And B, as a total package, will you personally and your caucus be able to support Step Up? Uh, thank you, Brad. I, uh, I'm too short for this microphone, I think. But uh, 
Charles won't have that problem. But I uh, appreciate you having me here. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, before I get started on my uh, deal, I saw that one legislator has been looking at the same polling I have about how unpopular the legislature is. Senator Adam Pugh escaped introducing himself, and I want to make sure you hold him accountable as well. He's <laughs> sitting at uh, table 102 uh, if anyone wants to talk to him. Uh, but anyway, uh, the step up plan. Uh, I was sitting at the table with Mr. Rainbolt and the treasurer, so I had my arm twi no, I, I, we had a, a good conversation about it. As many of you know, in the first special session, uh, Senate Republicans uh, put forth a plan that we deemed A+. plus. We deemed it A+, plus because we liked it and thought it was a great plan. Uh, it raised $460 million in new recurring revenue, and it paid for a true teacher pay raise. So I'm going to break this question up into three parts, really. You broke it up into two. Do teachers deserve a pay raise, and do we need to deliver on that pay raise of the $5,000 you mentioned? Absolutely. Teachers, uh, we are losing teachers, but also we need to recruit bright minds in college to go into the profession. But if we give a teacher pay raise, it must be paid for. And in order to pay for a teacher pay raise, you can't do it without some new recurring revenue. And so that's the reason the Senate got very serious in a bipartisan fashion in crafting a plan. It was far from perfect, but it was a plan in revenue. We are excited that people in the business community have, have stepped up uh, and are bringing us a plan. The plan has many of the components that we had in what we called A+. Plus. We had the cigarette tax at $1.50. We had uh, diesel and gasoline at $0.06 cents each. We did not have the income tax portion uh, that is now in the step up plan, and we did not have the yet to be defined wind portion of this step up plan. I know they're working diligently with some in the wind industry to try to come up with a plan, and I hope the wind industry is serious about moving Oklahoma forward and will come with a serious plan, not one that decreases their liability, but one where they actually uh, contribute more to the state. So if the wind industry comes to, to the table with a very serious plan, uh, I think it, it deserves great attention. Will I support it and will my caucus support it? I have pledged to those who are uh, organizing the step up plan that we're gonna try to pursue passage of a revenue package that includes the teacher pay. Will my caucus support it? We've got a bunch of individuals in the state Senate, but I will tell you the best whip count you could ever have of any, uh, any measure is a vote that you've had on the board. And we've had two votes on the Senate board where my members have cast votes for three quarters of what's in the step up plan. I'll be interested to see, hear from the, the speaker and the minority leader of the House of what they think is viable to come over to the Senate and we'll address it when it comes over. But we are serious about solving our budget problem and we've demonstrated that time and again. Thank you, sir. Speaker McCall, same two questions. Thank you, Brad. Good morning, and good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. In just a few days, uh, we will start a constitutional session, the second half of the 56th uh, legislature. Um, I'm, with regard and respect to the Step Up Plan, I think there are some things very unique about it, um, and I think very positive about the Step Up Plan. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, in terms of it being a reasonable compromise. I think that it is. Uh, first of all, it is a compromise. The package is not everything in it does our caucus love. I mean, there's some tough, tough issues in there, but that's what a compromise is about. Compromise is giving uh, in order to find a solution, and that's what we do in the legislature. The step up plan is, I commend the coalition group who has uh, supported this publicly. Um, I think it's very rare and unique when, so, when, a, when broad support uh, comes together for a very broad plan. I think, once again, this is one of the most broad approaches, broad packages that we've seen in the last uh, 12 months. But in that, it is everybody, not just one industry, not just one segment, is being, 
being focused, and I think that is a plus about the Step Up Oklahoma plan. We have, we have, cha we will have new challenges this year in the legislature that we were not faced with last year. We know that there's a chance that we may lose funding, federal funding, uh, for our state's uh, medical residency program. And if that happens, we're going to have an additional burden on our shoulders of roughly $76 million. So is the step up plan reasonable? Of course, but that's not all that is, not just the revenue is a part of the step up. What makes step up unique is that there are reforms that go with it. The stabilization fund, the government accountability office, those are huge reforms for the state of Oklahoma. Those will ensure greater success and prosperity, I think, for our state going forward. The revenue is a short-term fix to immediate problems that we have. The reforms put us on a place a more solid footing going forward in making sure that our government uh, going forward does a better job with those with, with those tax dollars. Uh, so yes, I think it is a reasonable compromise program. I think in terms of the second part of the question, in terms of support, I will be supporting the plan. I know a majority of our caucus uh, supports the plan. I feel like that this plan uh, can pass the House of Representatives. If, the, if our Democratic colleagues deliver the votes, the number of votes that they delivered on A+, I believe this, this plan can pass. And uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity to answer the question. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Okay, Senator Sparks. Thank you, and uh, thank you again for having us uh, this morning. Um, as we approach this, the, the best thing that we've, I've seen out of this, and my colleagues I've spoke to, is an acknowledgement that we have a problem. Um, that, uh, for the last several years, nonetheless, even though we've had uh, budget shortfalls, budget failures, um, there's been this underlying theme that we need to stay the course, that uh, the policies that were enacted are, are bearing fruit. And apparent, it's nice to see that uh, so there's a change in that attitude. Uh, is the step up plan the plan? Uh, I'm not really sure yet. Uh, we haven't seen a bill. Uh, most of the conversations have been focused on the House thus far while we have something in the Senate scheduled for this afternoon, we're really not sure what is envisioned at this point. Um, I, um, at, at these moments, it's uh, always important to be tactful and not just uh, uh, snide. But um, do we need to do we need to generate revenues? Absolutely. Do we need to uh, have consensus absolutely um, but um, we should also understand a lot of people come to the legislatures with ideas that they feel strongly about and it's the legislature's job to give those uh, sincere thought and um, I think that's happening in this case and I believe at the end of the day a uh, package that uh, is beneficial will be passed and I think you will get our support in the Senate uh, once we've had an opportunity to uh, really review and have substantive input on that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Representative Copeland. Well, it's always nice to be the last one on the panel to answer a question because you hear a lot of the statements made prior to it. And a lot of things about a question is how it's stated. A couple of words in the question uh, kind of raises a flag to me, and that's reasonable compromise. Uh, those of you in here that are married, I'm sure you've had <laughs> discussions with your spouse, and I have found that one of the worst words that you would bring up at those times is reasonable, because it all depends on which side of the fence you're on. If you say, yes, it's a reasonable deal, then the 
it's okay if you say no, then you're the one that's unreasonable or the other person is. So um, you get branded as being one or the other. Uh, we were uh, privy to the conversations from the group uh, in December and we have been visiting with the uh, step up group our caucus has of this month and uh, previous to that. We have some things about the uh, plan that uh, we think are, are good. We, for a long time, have been saying uh, we don't need to be cutting the state's revenue. We need more revenue. And uh, I think most of our members uh, believe that that is the positive part of the, the plan is the additional revenue sources. Now, where that revenue comes from is the real kicker. We, we visited and, and suggested some uh, compromises that we would like to see uh, in the legislation. We don't know whether they have been taken to heart, whether any of them have been uh, addressed. And like uh, someone on the panel said previously, until we see the legislation, it's hard to just come out and say yes or no. But I think there is a real desire on the part of the Democratic Caucus to raise res revenue and address the multiple problems we have, such as the teacher pay raise, uh, and one that I, I've been concerned about in the uh, whole process is the four-day school week. I mean, we were, we were concerned and have been told that the business community has a problem recruiting businesses to the state of Oklahoma because of the four-day school week. I have yet to have a real solid answer as how this addresses that. I think the pay teacher pay raise is great. Teachers deserve it. The state employees deserve a pay raise, which is not addressed in here. Uh, there are a number of things that issues that we have brought up, and uh, until I could say personally or from the caucus standpoint of whether we support it or not, we'll have to see the legislation and see just how it's written. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Speaker McGall, we'll start with you on this question. Oklahoma ranks first in the country in female incarceration and second for men. Um, that's on a per capita basis. However, last year there were a number of key criminal justice reform bills that failed to move forward, especially in the House. Do you believe that this year will be different so that our limited state resources can be used on mental health, rehabilitation, and other diversion programs for low-level and nonviolent offenders rather than building new prison facilities that could cost taxpayers up to two billion dollars? Uh, thank you for the question, Brad. And, and yes, uh, you know, our legislative uh, sessions are two years. So we're in the second half of the 56th legislature, which means when we come back into regular session next Monday, all of the measures where they ended last year are still right where they, they were. Uh, we have multiple bills uh, that uh, on that subject that are uh, ready to be to ready to move forward. It's my intent to see those move as quickly as possible. Uh, this legislative session. Uh, it is my intent to uh, appoint conferees uh, on those bills that are in conference in the first week of, uh, of our session. And once those conference committees uh, sign those out, they will be ready to, to be voted on on the floor. So that's, that's what we, uh, I see happening with those bills, but it is, it is our intent uh, to, to move those Early, I know there's additional communication with between <clears throat> multiple groups that have an interest uh, in those in those bills, um, but I I believe that they will move uh, early and, and complete the process this year, as I have stated previously. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Sparks. My understanding is your district may have more beds than anybody else. Prison beds. Yes. Yes. Prison, yeah, it's, I suspect we all have the same number of beds, but you're right. The, uh, um, but your point, point well made, though, yeah. that uh, not only, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a district that's uh, uh, 
an exercise in extremes with uh, the University of Oklahoma and uh, uh, two of our larger prisons down the uh, east of Lexington. Uh, it's a stark reminder of which way you want to go in your life. Um, so, uh, no, this is a concern, though, and visiting down there, uh, you see the problems uh, not only in the uh, prisons, but uh, with the families of those in prison that uh, tend to migrate to that area and issues um, outside the walls that are, that are real uh, results and real cost of having people incarcerated. Um, I understand there's been some changes in positions uh, with certain individuals in the legislature and so I I would say that uh, I am as hopeful that we can get some of this done this year as I've been in a while. Uh, I think the support's there. Uh, looks like there's a, been a shift in the individuals in the legislature and so I am very hopeful. And I appreciate the fact that you brought out that, that words really matter. So. <laughs> Okay, Representative Copeland. Well, I think uh, our caucus has, has long proven that we support uh, criminal justice reform. Back when the Speaker Steele was there, our caucus was very supportive of things that he did. Uh, the sad thing to me is that, you know, the thing that we're talking about even in the step-up plan and revenue-raising issues is the thing that's really brought this to light in the state of Oklahoma is money. You know, the, the fact that we don't have enough money to, to uh, really fund our uh, Department of Corrections and we, you know, we need to do this as a cost-saving matter more than, and that's what brought the attention to it anyway. So, I mean, that is kind of disturbing, but we, we are, are very supportive of uh, reforms and, and helping keep families together and the effects of, of uh, incarceration on, on families, so yes, we'll, we will uh, support uh, measures where uh, we can. Thank you, sir. Senator Tree. Uh, thank you for the question. I've been intimately involved in this issue for the past few years. I'm the author of most of the criminal justice reform bills uh, that, that either made it all the way through or, or stalled, well, not stalled, you're right, we're a two-year legislature, so we're still alive in the House. And I was also the author of some bills with Representative Pam Peterson, who's termed out from Tulsa, that, that passed a couple years ago that made some real meaningful reform. The great thing about those reforms was that we were in line and with the district attorneys. We had district attorneys involved. We had public defenders. We had the whole gamut. This last year, we had a little bit bigger divide on where should we go on it. And so I'm very excited within the last few weeks, I've been sitting down with district attorneys who are very uh, reasonable and see this day to day. And I've been sitting down with advocates of criminal justice reform. And I am very uh, excited to come up with compromise from our first question, a reasonable compromise in this arena. This isn't just a budget issue because if we really wanna take care of it, we will fund things uh, known as uh, intermediate revocation centers which will divert people away from the prison beds and will get them the treatment they need and divert them from a life of incarceration, a life that leads to more foster care and a life that leads to pr citizens that aren't taxpaying citizens uh, locked up behind the bars, uh, drowned in debt with all the fees and all the other things. So I am extremely excited with what I've seen in, in meetings in my office uh, with both the advocates of criminal justice reform and the, the people on the front lines protecting our communities in the district attorney's office. So I think you will see great momentum uh, this session. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, and we, the next question will start with Senator Sparks. Um, last year there were a number of bills, I mean upwards I think of 49 uh, bills that introduced or allowed firearms into public venues such as sporting events, concerts, etc., college campuses, churches. Um, my understanding is this year there may be upwards of 60 that get introduced, 30 that carry over from last year and, and an additional 30. Uh, what's your opinion of the importance of expanding the Second Amendment only in a way that does not reduce or eliminate the rights of business, proper, vi business property owners to control weapons, harm economic development, or jeopardize public safety? Thank you. 
Mm. So uh, I would agree that we, we should. I, how's that for a strong start? <laughs> Yeah, we've, the, the, gun, the gun bills are getting a little crazy. Um, and, uh, you know, I represent Core Norman. Uh, you know, the easiest place to represent if you're opposed to the guns on campus bills. And yet, on election days, the only calls I've ever had from people driving to the polls um, was, were, uh, are you a member of the NRA? Those were the only calls I've ever received on the day of the election. So uh, this is, uh, to say this is a, not a strong issue, I guess we would all know that that's an understatement. But uh, I would suggest we are going to continue to see these bills until there's some political cost to doing so. Um, and I'll just give you the one example that's most uh, uh, poignant to me. Uh, a couple of years ago when the bill ran through that would have allowed guns on any county-owned property during sporting events. Uh, that went through. Fortunately, uh, one of my colleagues uh, brought that to our attention. We we're like, hey, among other things, this means you can throw a shotgun over your shoulder and walk into the College World Series out at the softball field. Governor vetoed that. We were able to, to suppress that. We, we raised the alarm ahead of time, but nobody really thought it was that important. Um, they didn't challenge the veto, however, that was kind of dicey. Uh, but none of that ever showed up on any of the scorecards. And so when we said, why, isn't, why aren't those kind of votes showing up on the scorecards? The response was, it's really not a business issue. And so I wouldn't say that until there's some political cost associated with bringing these bills, you will, you will see them and some will slip by. Thank you. Representative Copeland. Well, I think the senators made a good comment there, but I, I personally, when we allowed schools to, uh, to have guns on campus at public schools, I was a little concerned about that. Uh, I, no one at that capital or any anywhere I know of will tell you that they oppose the Second Amendment. Uh, everybody supports the Second Amendment. It's to the extent of which you think it, you should go. I think businesses, uh, schools, law enforcement, all of those entities ought to have a say in how it's implemented on, on their territory, whether it's the schools or an individual's business or whatever. I think they ought to have a say in, uh, in how legislation is formed. So I personally, and I think my caucus would be very hesitant in supporting anything that uh, any of those entities felt jeopardized the safety of the people that they're uh, over or businesses they have or the schools that they run. Thanks, sir. Senator Tree. Thank you, Brad, for that question. The, the Second Amendment and private property rights are not mutually exclusive. They can coexist in this world, and they have for 200 years. I, I think that uh, there are real economic impacts on things like NCAA tournaments, on the NBA, and those things that we need to be cognizant of when we make policy at the Capitol. But we also uh, need to be cognizant that the Second Amendment has protected our liberty for over 200 years. I carry a weapon most oftentimes, uh, but I also respect the right of a private business owner to say I can't bring that into their business. I respect that in certain public venues that are trying to attract uh, national events that we may need to have some rational, reasonable discussion, but they are not mutually exclusive. They can coexist and they do quite well here in Oklahoma. Okay. Mr. Speaker. Senator, that was less than a minute. Congratulations. Yeah, well, thank I'm you. I'm impressed. Yeah. You can take my balance. <laughs> you could have yielded me that. Yeah. Your time. <clears throat> the Second Amendment is is paramount to, to many Oklahomans. There have been the House of Representatives, we are a, a body of 101 members. Legislators will introduce the bills that they believe are pertinent uh, to their constituencies. But per, I will always be an advocate for the Second Amendment of our U.S. Constitution. 
private property rights, I will always be an advocate for that. And the two can coexist. They are not one and the same issue, they are two separate issues. We can protect our constitutional rights with respect not only to the Second Amendment, but to all of them. And we can ensure that business owners maintain the discretion and the ability to determine what the best policy is for their particular business. I, as a business owner, have a very, I have an opinion as to what would be, what, whether uh, firearms are conducive in my business. I'm also respectful of the customers, the clientele that I have, and their wishes as well. In terms of the legislation that may be proposed, and, and every year there are multiple uh, ideas from protecting our Second Amendment rights to making sure that we foster the right environment in the state of Oklahoma conducive for business. And I believe we can strike a balance of fostering a good, positive economic environment in, this, in our state while protecting our Second Amendment rights as individuals. Thank you. Senator Sparks. Just as a follow-up to my start, I am a member of the NRA. I go dove hunting with a 10-gauge. But since I started, I don't think I ought to talk again. <laughs> All right. Representative Copeland, our chamber on a regular basis engages the Pew Incentive Review Committee, which evaluates and makes recommendations on the effectiveness and the impact uh, on ROI for Oklahoma's economic development programs on a data-driven basis. What is your perspective on the importance of this process and the overall need to protect incentive programs as vital economic development tools? Well, these aren't uh, new to the state. We've had them a long time. We have a lot of them. Uh, in my 10 years in the legislature, I've noticed uh, when I first came in, uh, we were going to right-size government, which was the code word for shrinking government. And then when we started running out of revenue and we needed some more revenue, we started looking at these incentives and talking about how many there were and what we need to do. Uh, the problem is most of those incentives were developed by business communities and, and business leaders for specific purposes. And they're not going to be removed easily. Uh, that progressed to the point where we formed this commission to look at the uh, incentives. And I think that was a good idea, but it took us a long time to get that in place. I think what we really need to make sure of is that that commission has the autonomy to, to make those decisions, look at all incentives, and come up with uh, recommendations that are truly acted on. One that concerns me is the uh, capital gains tax deduction that was recommended by the committee, or the, the group that was paid to look at these and then rejected by the committee. So, I mean, I think if they're truly going to be autonomous and do this, we need to let them do their work, look at these uh, incentives, and determine whether they truly are benefiting the state of Oklahoma and then take action on them. Because you can, I've been on a lot of boards and commissions in my life, and there's two ways to really do nothing. One is to set up a committee to look at it, and one is to set up a commission to look at something. So we have got to let them operate and be open, transparent, but autonomous, and do their job and not limit any incentive, no matter what it is, and, and get true evaluations of the benefit to them. But it is hard to, to remove those. We've taken very few tax incentives away since I've been in legislature. And it's because uh, individuals like yourselves see the value in them. They come up and they talk to us, and we're, you know, we see that and we're not willing to go out there and remove them. So I don't think the uh, 
the threat of having a lot of incentives removed from the business community is as, as dire as they may think. Thank you. Senator Tree. Thank you. I, I used to think the closest thing to eternal life was getting into a tax credit. Uh, the, the tax credits <laughs> seem to get there and never get reviewed. Uh, so I am excited about the incentive review. Uh, we need to make, have data to make decisions. And all of us have lives outside the legislature. None of us are experts on every industry that you're in or the impact uh, that those tax incentives have. Where there is just pure, quote unquote, corporate welfare, we need to eliminate it. Where there is a return on investment to the state of Oklahoma and those dollars wouldn't be there absent the incentive, we need to foster it and maybe improve it. And we can't make those dis decisions absent objective, data-driven policy recommendations they make to us. The recommendations are only as good as what we act on them. And uh, a lot of times, what uh, Representative Copeland said is true. We, we see those reports and we never take action on them. So I hope that the legislature takes action, uh, looks at the recommendations with a great deal of seriousness. And I can tell you, uh, if, if you were at the state chamber meeting, you heard me hark on 640 and the damage that I think it's done to get policy making at the Capitol. Uh, tax credits get a much closer look because it's a 51% vote. It's not a 75% vote. So it, it is something that is under more scrutiny. I've read about 400 of the bills this year that are uh, in the Senate have been filed. 729 bills have been filed and I've read through about 400 of them. And I would say about 375 of them have to do with some kind of tax incentive. That may be a stretch. Uh, but a big number of them have to do with tax incentives. It's a huge issue at the Capitol, and I hope that we take the recommendations of the Incentive Review Commission uh, very serious and, and act upon those. Speaker McCall. Thank you. I've been very clear in the past on tax incentives. Uh, first of all, we compete with every state in the union, especially in our region uh, for business and industry. The continued expansion of our business uh, community in the state of Oklahoma will be key to our success in being able to fund things in this state that are very needed. Uh, funding for education, health care, public safety. But just like any business, your business, you have to review what you did last year and you have to evaluate whether or not there was a good return on that investment for that dollar that you invested in whatever project it may be. State of Oklahoma, the way I see it, is, is very much like a, is akin to a business in that the people of the state of Oklahoma are the shareholders and is, in, is paramount uh, for the leaders to take a look at where they're allocating the, the people's dollars and ensuring that there is a return on investment. If a tax credit is working, we need to continue it. If it worked at one time, but the return is not as high, we need to take a look at how that can be modified or tweaked. I think that's, I think the review commission is doing a good job. I think they are refining their processes uh, from year to year. Um, and hopefully we will get to a point where we have a standardized method, methodology of reviewing incentives. But if it's a good return on investment for the people of Oklahoma, we need, to, we need to continue with that. If it's not, it needs to be scrapped and those dollars need to be reallocated uh, to another spot. And, and once again, okay, coming back to long-term success of the state of Oklahoma, I'm very proud that the House of Representatives passed a $6,000 teacher pay raise last year. That is very important to us. That's why the Step Up Oklahoma plan is important to us in funding that. But we have education needs beyond that. Our economic climate and the size of our economy needs to continue to move forward, grow, and expand in the future. And this is one of those areas that is very helpful in allowing us to compete and achieve those goals. Thank you. Senator Sparks. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would echo what everybody said up here with just uh, one little twist, which is I think we also need to realize there's a value to keeping our word as a state 
to businesses that have relied upon business incentives um, to the tax structure uh, and have come to Oklahoma or stayed in Oklahoma and made significant investments. Uh, once we have a business partner in that situation, I think we are bound to uh, follow through with our end of it. Now, it may be that uh, maybe we need two tracks, one for business incentives looking forward and one that looks at those in place. It may be that those that we have in place, if we had a crystal ball and could do it over again, maybe we wouldn't do it again. But just because a deal isn't optimal, I still think we have an obligation to do our part. Uh, you know, if we, if we get the reputation that we're a good business partner as long as everything's going our way, but otherwise you can't depend upon the state, I think that's very good. So uh, I think there needs to be a balance here between, uh, as I said, reviewing the business incentives that are in place uh, versus those moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Senator Treat, we'll start with you. And uh, there's been a number of concerns raised about state question 788, which is the medical marijuana, uh, which is on the ballot in June. Spe specifically, um, many believe it goes too far and it would make Oklahoma the most liberal medical marijuana state in the country because it could have a profound impact on employers' workforce. We'd like your thoughts on how to address the issue. And do you think that the state question should be passed or defeated? And as a follow-up, would you be in favor of making more restrict, make it more restrictive through legislation either before or after it passes? It's a, a big issue that the voters of Oklahoma are going to have to decide in the primary. And uh, the governor, as you know, put it on the primary ballot. It's polling right now as if it's going to pass, although I've seen some of the numbers where it's a downward trend. I will tell you, it's one of the most poorly written uh, state questions I have seen. And I'm sorry if you're the one who wrote it. I don't mean any offense <laughs> to you. Uh, people are very sympathetic, and I'm sympathetic as well. I've got a few friends that are in hospice care on the last days of their life. Some swear by the benefits of uh, marijuana to increase appetite when they don't have an appetite. Some swear by uh, it is a pain reliever. The science is shoddy. Science is, is difficult to get to on a substance that has been illegal, although it's not impossible. And one of the big issues that the states who have found a way to either legalize uh, full-on recreational, which make no mistake, this bill really isn't a, a medical marijuana bill. It's really a recreational use. The uh, uh, people who never have had prescribing authority before all of a sudden have prescribing authority under this bill. And it is a, a true recreational marijuana. So when you're voting, know that that's what it's about. There are several bills in the works uh, that pre seem to preemptively and only go into effect upon the passage of this state question. Uh, Dr. Yen on our side has a bill, and I know Representative J.P. Jordan on the House side has them. I'm sure there's some that I've, I've not read yet. I'm very interested in working with those people to try to come up with solutions if the voters of Oklahoma choose to pass it. I think the way it's rift written, I think the way it's drafted, um, will cause a nightmare when it comes to policy implementation. So right now, absent uh, having something passed that preemptively uh, fixes those issues, I can't vote for that state question personally. Uh, I'm very sympathetic, though, uh, to those people who, who feel like it's their last resort to have some form of appetite or some form of pain relief. And, and I think Oklahoma voters are sympathetic to that, too. But I want them to know they are not voting for medical marijuana. They are voting for recreational marijuana. Thank you. Speaker? Thank you. I'm, I, I'm respectful of the people of Oklahoma and, and as a legislator and how they vote. I will tell you I have serious and grave concerns about this state question and the implications um, that uh, will be a, the consequences of its passage. There will be tremendous 
challenges and, and hurdles uh, in the business community and really throughout the state if it, were, if it passes. I think the people of the state of Oklahoma really need to take a hard, long look at this particular ballot measure um, and educate themselves and hopefully the business community will put forth a, um, a campaign or a message um, in terms of how it will affect the state of Oklahoma. There are some bills that are preemptive. Uh, I will tell you if this passes, we will, we will be dealing with the, the outcome of the election if it were to pass um, in the following session. There will just be a lot of things that we were going to have to navigate, especially in the business world. As a business owner, I'm concerned about uh, the, those new challenges that that would create. I think if we are looking um, truly at it, marijuana for a medicinal purpose, the, the measure could have been written a lot differently. Uh, the fact that the legislature has authorized the last few years the use of CBD oils, treatment of illnesses, which is a derivative of, of the plant. We'll see how the people of the state of Oklahoma vote, and we will, we will respond accordingly, but there's no question it's going to introduce a lot of new wrinkles and challenges for the state if uh, that state question um, were passed by the people. Thank you. Senator Sparks. Thank you. Thank you. So, so again, um, I would echo what was said before that uh, you know, when you take a major um, step in a new policy area like this, you're inevitably going to have follow-up legislation as you should to, to fine-tune the uh, implementation of it. Uh, not that we can do anything about this up here, but um, it's all a little troublesome given the uncertainty on the federal level of enforcement. Um, I think it would be a lot easier for all of us in all the states if there was uh, clarity on the federal level, you know, what, what laws are going to be in place and which ones are going to be enforced uh, moving forward on an issue um, that you, you, we, none of us know whether or not uh, it's going to be enforced. Indeed, in some place like Oklahoma where you have multiple U.S. attorneys, you don't know if it may be enforced in the Western District of Oklahoma versus the Northern District of Oklahoma. Uh, much less state to state. Uh, so, uh, you know, the cloud over all of this is the uncertainty on the federal level. Um, but um, we'll see what the people decide and, uh, and then respond, which uh, is kind of the way these state questions work. Okay. Representative Copeland. Well, this is the one I'm out there on, folks. I'm not, <laughs> not an expert on marijuana, no, no. I know in agriculture, we've encouraged the use of, of the growing of uh, industrial hemp, but it had nothing to do with this. So uh, <laughs> I, I have to honor the fact that the petitioners went through the process, they got the signatures, they've got it put on the ballot. I also, uh, understand the concerns that are addressed by a, a lot of folks but you know a lot of things that are legal still creates problems with the opioid issue legal drugs and illegal drugs causes a lot of, of problems in our society so i think i think fear of this shouldn't be the only reason to oppose it uh, because it's new the medical aspects uh, and having known people who have gone through uh, terminal illnesses and the prospect of this possibly helping those would uh, tend to have me lean to vote for it. But, uh, you know, unless someone can convince me that there's a reason, a sound reason that that shouldn't happen. But I, I, think, I think fear shouldn't be the only reason we would, we would oppose uh, this. I think, I think there is, I, I heard the term shoddy science used on, I'm not sure, but I have heard uh, people tell me that it is of benefit to some folks in certain medical conditions. And uh, as a 
a person who has had a bill in the House of Representatives for a two or three sessions now to uh, basically death with dignity for individuals that have a terminal illness to have an, an option how to end their life on their own terms and haven't been able to get heard in committee yet but uh, and know that it's probably not going anywhere anyway but I, I have a compassion compassion for individuals that find themselves in that condition so uh, I think the people are going to have to decide and I would be leaning toward supporting it okay thank you and we want to be uh, respectful of, of everybody's time but if you indulge us we'll ask each of the panelists to just give a one minute wrap up and uh, we'll go from there and I'll, I'll start with uh, or Speaker McCall. Just one minute. One minute. Okay. And you've already burned five seconds. <laughs> Reset the clock. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being, allowing me to be here this morning. Uh, we've, uh, we're looking forward to the session starting next week. I think, obviously, teacher pay is, continues to be the number one issue in the House of Representatives, as it was last year. Um, we realize that we have to fund that, and that takes revenue to do, do so. Uh, there are multiple uh, other measures that uh, are important to the House. The, I think is the uh, Governmental Accountability Office is a, is a uh, very um, great piece of legislation uh, that we will be considering in the House. But I am... Uh, I'm optimistic. I believe in the state of Oklahoma. I know we will be starting in a much better position this year than what we came into last year. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. And uh, we appreciate the business community, the job that you do. Uh, when you're successful, the state of Oklahoma is successful. So I hope you have a very prosperous 2018, and the state of Oklahoma will reap the benefits of that. Thank you and have a great day. Senator Sparks. Uh, thank you for having me again today. This is, I guess this is my last time to appear up here. Um, and uh, as I'm term limiting, I want to thank you for always uh, providing such a warm uh, reception in the past. I've always enjoyed working with you all. Uh, I think I've let my membership last. I need to take care of that. But other than that, I know you all need to get to work and so do I. So with that, I'll just say thank you. Well, I'm a giver, so I'm going to give you a minute of your time and just thank you for being here. And I'll waste <laughs> another minute and, and say, uh, hope to see you next year. Okay, Senator Treat. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm sorry Senator Schultz could not be here. The pro tem of the Senate was dealing with some family matters back home, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to spend the morning with you. I'll tell you the three priorities uh, of mine personally are getting a budget that's stable and can and, and uh, stabilize for the future, not just for the short term. It, within that is a teacher pay raise, really continuing to, to improve foster care and adoption in Oklahoma. We have a real problem there, and it doesn't get enough attention. We've got to keep our foot on the pedal there. And to pass real criminal justice reform that has the support of both the advocates for criminal justice reform and the law enforcement. I think we're going to do it this year. but. Uh, strap in, right? I mean, it's a gubernatorial race and election year, so it's about to get uh, even crazier. So, thanks for the opportunity. Great. Great discussion. We certainly want to thank all you for your time and your candor. Uh, we certainly wish you the best in this next legislative session. And uh, I think you've got an idea. We'll all be watching. So. Uh, but this is a resource. This whole room is a resource to use. It's the business community, and, and feel free to use it. So let's give our panelists a round of applause. With that, Rhonda. All right. We're not letting you get off the stage until you pay, pay your dues. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for our sponsors. Thank you to Brad for doing a great job of moderating today. And, excellent. And to all our legislators in the room, please know that we are here to help. Our government relations team will be ha happy to help in any way on any business issue. 
The chamber and our members are a resource for any questions you might have or feedback you might need relative to business issues. And I tell you, um, all the members that are in attendance, please speak up because the chamber can only be successful on our pro-business legislation if we have your input. And together, we can, all together with our legislature, lead to a state of prosperity and success. And that's what Oklahoma is destined to always be and will be in the future. Thank you so much for being here. We are adjourned.